we've been spending quite a bit of time at the new Firewood Spires recently, as they are incredibly good both in terms of war effort and in terms of credits gained. One of the fun facts of the Spires is that they don't really require any kind of specialized build. Even a Sidewinder with a Pulse Razor can show up and join in on the fun and the credit making. With that being said, here at the Antixino Initiative, we of course had to ask the question, okay, but what is the best build to participate in Spire activities? Once Fargoid Banshees are cleared from the ground, as they do not respawn, the primary target at Sargoid Spires becomes Fargoid Orthrus Interceptors. Orthruses are maybe the most passive of the interceptor variants. They do not shoot back. Their only defense consists of a shutdown field that they trigger when they are aggroed. And Trich, by the way, in the Spire sites doesn't always trigger as the inbound interceptors, that is, the ones that spawn from black clouds and not from the Spires themselves somehow do not fire the shutdown field at all. They also have an anti-guardian field that only occasionally triggers, and at Spire sites doesn't appear to actually trigger all that often for whatever reason. And exactly what causes an anti-guardian field to trigger or not is still under the subject of investigation. Suffice to say, it does not trigger often. Besides those two defense mechanisms, the only things that stand in the way between you and that juicy 40 million bond is the Fargoid's shield and the Fargoid's hull. Unlike every other interceptor, the Fargoid Orphrus does not have hearts and does not regenerate its hull. Such a setting brings into play what is maybe the Cinderella weapon of AX combat. Garden Gauss cannons are the king of the heart snipe, modified shard cannons are maybe the best weapons all around, but when it comes to raw damage, and in particular raw hull damage, nothing beats Guardian Plasma Chargers, and in particular, they're expensive in terms of materials, but incredibly effective, modified version that is available for purchase in the Emboni system. Modified plasma charges only come up to medium in size. And even with experimental weapon stabilizers of class 5, the most we'll be able to fit on a ship is 6 due to the experimental's weapons limitation. So what we're going to look for is a ship that can fit 6 modified plasma chargers. Three ships have the mounts necessary to mount 6 medium modified plasma charges. The first one is that hulking behemoth known as a Type 10. The Type 10 has the most hard points overall, but it is really slow, and it doesn't turn particularly well. The second sub-ship is the Imperial Cutter. Unlike the Type 10, the Cutter is very fast, although with really poor acceleration, in particular with regards to its lateral acceleration. Cutter is also gated behind a pretty lengthy Imperial rank grind. And finally, the oldest of the three, the ship that people say you used to be able to get for free at Hutton Orbital, the Anaconda. The Anaconda is quite a bit slower, but more maneuverable than the Cutter. Maybe more importantly, the Anaconda is the only one of the three that has a class 8 power distributor, whereas the Cutter and the Type 10 both only have a class 7, and that makes quite a bit of a difference in practice. Now, I did say that all ships can mount six medium modified Guardian Plasma chargers, however, I didn't quite say that can practically use them. When you look at the convergence of these weapons at the 1 km fall off range of plasma chargers, what you find is that the Type 10 has just as outright terrible convergence. The Cutter doesn't do too bad for 5 out of its 7 medium or larger hardpoints, but the remaining 2 are also very, very bad at the wingtips. It's like basically impossible to get them on target, or it's possible, but it's extremely awkward. On the flip side, the Anaconda has some pretty good convergence in my book. So as always, what ship you fly is up to you, and pretty much any ship can work. However, if you ask for my recommendation, for this particular purpose, it will be the Anaconda. I call this particular build the Cytoplasma Conda, after its two signature weapons, the plasma chargers, the modified plasma chargers I mentioned, and Cytosclamber boost lasers that are a power plate weapon that go into its small hard points. Let's see how to build it. In its hard points, you'll find six of its signature weapons. These are the Guardian plasma chargers, pre-engineered, also known as MPCs for modified plasma chargers. These come as uh, effectively overcharged and focused weapons with a whopping plus 66% damage in addition to a whopping plus 37.5 armor piecing, which effectively compounds their damage, and five times the shot speed of regular plasma chargers. Not very, and, and furthermore, they also have additional ammo to boot. So these are incredibly more powerful weapons than the regular ones that come at the price of even higher power draw for weapons that are already very, very distributor hungry. And slightly higher thermal load over this one doesn't particularly matter in practice. So you put all six of these 
into the medium slots. And then you have two cytoscrambler burst laters, which typically are engineered with a long range um, modification and an oversized experimental. Uh, these are small lasers that effectively do as much damage as large ones, but only on shields. They practically do no hull damage whatsoever. So they were very effective at, at damaging shields, and the interesting thing is you could fire these while holding the charge of your NPCs and still do some shield damage while waiting for the shield to drop, and then you can release the plasma charge shot and hit the hull with it, doing devastating damage. In terms of utilities, you'll find four caustic sink launchers um, in the spires. There's practically caustic everywhere. Because orifices get destroyed left and right, there's just these enormous caustic clouds that bathe the entire instance in some cases, and it's practically impossible to avoid falling into one of them every now and then. So caustic sink launchers do a great job at soaking up that caustic and avoid it having effect in your hull. I have a couple of pre-engineered heat sinks. These are probably the ones I use the least. They're not that important. You can fire one whenever you have like an overheating problem, or you can fire one doing an interdiction to stay cold and get a little less damage. But they don't do much here. You could put a shield booster if you want it, or you could put additional caustic sink if you wanted to do that as an alternative. Then you find a shutdown fuel neutralizer. This is an incredibly important module in this instance where Orphrosis fire shutdown fields all the time, and Cyclopses that occasionally show up also fire shutdown fields. So you can get, get shutdown fields being fired left and right, and without a shutdown field neutralizer, you're at the mercy of uh, staying close to some of your wingmates that do have one for their protection. Note I have opted to use a shutdown field neutralizer instead of a newer Fargoid pulse neutralizer. The Fargoid pulse neutralizer also protects you against Banshee shutdown missiles. Uh, however, by the time you're in a spy or fighting orifices, all Banshees should already be destroyed. And since they don't respawn, you practically should never see Banshee um, surface to air missiles coming towards you. And the thing about the Fargoid pulse neutralizer is that it has a range of zero, as you can see here. It only protects you, it does not protect anyone around you. On the flip side, the Fargoid uh, Shadow Field Neutralizer has a range of three kilometers, which means that if you're charging it, you're protecting not only yourself, but you're covering also every other commander that is within three kilometers of you. This means that in a wing, if multiple people are firing the Shadow Fields overlapping, there's a very healthy degree of uh, protection of each other. And as a result, I constantly I pr pr uh, suggest to equip a Shadow Field Neutralizer on this build, which is generally intended to be used in a wing. And finally, there's an enhanced Xeno scanner. You could also res use a regular scanner here. It doesn't really matter. Uh, or even a pulse wave scanner is going to basically do the same thing. Uh, the only intent and goal of having an enhanced Xeno scanner is to allow you to see what the status of a shield on an Orphrus is to give you a bit more situational awareness in terms of how and when you want to release your plasma shots. Moving on to internals, the Conda likes Mary the Great Composite. Uh, there's no benefit into a higher grade armor as, as um, practically not even getting shot at in this instance. And all you want is a significant buffer in terms of hull points. If you wanted, you could put um, the heavy duty armor and, um, um, and the experimental that goes with it typically, which is, um, what is it again? Uh, Heavy duty deep plating. Deep plating is experimental you'd want with this one. I'm lazy, I didn't put it on, but if you want, that's the one that goes with it. The power plant for this build ought to be an overcharge power plant. That's because the modified plasma chargers just take that much power to run with. And this is an incredibly power hungry build. Thankfully, the heat generated on this build doesn't really matter because stuff is not locking and shooting at you for the most part here. Again, you could put a thermal spread experimental in this G4 version of the overcharged power plant. doesn't matter at all. Again, I was lazy. I did not go to the engineer to put it on, and I'm sticking with this overcharged G4, which, which works. Thrusters are dirty drive, drooling drag drive. This is the default for practically every combat build, and I think there's not much to be added here. Frame shift drive. Again, this is purely a convenience. If you have the pre-engineered one from the CG, which is, I think, this one, uh, great. If not, if you just use a normal 6A with like increased range engineering and mass manager, that's fine. It doesn't really matter what you have here. 
life support, benefits from being light wave, but again, doesn't make all that much of a difference. Now, interesting one is a power distributor. I use the charge enhanced power distributor with super condits. Um, question some people ask is, well, why not a weapon focused power distributor? A weapon focused has a much higher weapons capacity that allows you to fire off one additional MPC shot uh, before essentially running out of juice. And that is actually quite handy. Um, the reason why I don't do a weapon focus uh, power distributor is because the weapon focus power distributor, yes, has higher additional weapons capacity. However, it has a much lower systems capacity. And having a much lower systems capacity means that you have a much lower degree of protection from your uh, shutdown fuel neutralizer, which relies on system capacity to function. Once your system's capacitor is dry, your shutdown fuel neutralizer stops working and stops protecting you. Consequently, the additional benefit of having one more shot from weapon focused is offset by having your shutdown neutralizer time coverage essentially cut in half, which I think is too big of a compromise and not worth it. Consequently, I've gone with charge enhanced, but uh, your mileage may vary. If you feel work and focus works for you, uh, by all means, you should use weapon focus. Uh, sensors should be long range. Um, it's hard to lock on to Orpheus as they come into the instance cold, so having long range scanners is actually quite handy. Fuel tank, doesn't matter. You can use a default one, that's totally fine. Now moving to optional internals. In the class seven slot, you want a universal multi input controller. This is quite handy and it gives you in one single module access to both decal limpets and repair limpets, which for the most part, it's unlikely that you're going to need, but if you were to run out of caustic sinks, for example, decal limpets allow you to stay in the instance somewhat longer. In terms of shields, you'll see I use a bi-weave shield generator and I use this built with rainforest shields and low draw. This is probably not the most combat effective overall, but low draw allows to run in a 114 with just one pips to sys without over overdrawing your system's capacitor and consequently still letting you able to fire shutdown fuel neutralizers, even if you're charging your shields. And I find that's a quality of light convenience that is actually quite handy. And so this is my overall preference. Shield in this instance are really more of an insurance policy than anything from when you're shut down and go and hit the ground when you meet a swarm of like 20 or 25 scouts, they can provide a little bit of additional buffer and they kind of provide some quality of life in not having to individually repair your modules. A 64 ton cargo rack is more than enough. Even while running entirely out of ammo, I find myself very, very rarely using more than 20 limpets overall. So 64 is already overkill. You can even reduce this if you want. Again, try it out. Your mileage may vary, see what is convenient for you. A pellet TV icor hanger is not strictly necessary for hunting Orpheuses, but if you're an instance and you want to go down to the ground to destroy some of the banshees that may still be here, for example, having this is actually quite handy. The vehicles you want in your vehicle hanger for combat are the scorpions, and the vehicles you want if you're going to gather materials from the site are the scarabs, which have twice the cargo um, carriage capacity of the scorpions. So if you're in pure combat, just put scorpions. If you're just gathering stuff, you may want to use only scarabs. I have two and two as a bit of a balance. Again, your marriage may vary. An experimental weapon stabilizer is what allows you to equip uh, up to six weapons. So you're going to need one of these. And then you're going to have a hull reinforcement package in your military slot and another hull reinforcement package in a module reinforcement package in the other two class five slots for additional protection. And then what I have is I have four of the class four out of field maintenance units. These uh, actually sum up in terms of the speed at which they repair your modules. So if you were to say bump into an anti-guardian field that quickly wrecks your modified um, plasma chargers with free AFMUs, you can repair those modules very, very quickly. Um, you don't need all three. <laughs> Even just having one is usually sufficient. Again, this is a quality of life choice. And then in your two and one module size slots, I put module reinforcement packages, which come in handy for the additional damage protection, which stacks with a larger one. And based on damage priority, the larger module is always going to take damage before the smaller ones. And consequently, you only need to repair the larger one that provides a bigger buffer. And the smaller ones are there for the overall resistance. 
The way you fly this cytoplasma conda is you have all the plasma charges in a single fire group and the cytoscramber is on the second trigger. You can, if you want, also put the Xeno scanner on that second trigger. It doesn't matter very much. <coughs> then in the second fire group, you have all the caustic sink launchers in a single fire group. You don't need to split these. As a convenience, I have my scanners here, but again, it doesn't matter. And then finally, in the third fire group, I have the repair limpet and the decontamination limpet of a multi-limpet controller configured. So a very simple fire group configuration overall. And the way you use this is you fly 114 in terms of pips. So one pip to sys, one pip to eng, and four pips to web. Uh, and you practically never change that. Like the only time you may need to change that is if you're low on sys, because for example, your shields are charging and you somehow need to prepare for a pulse that's incoming. In that case, you may want to put four pips to sys, but that's practically the only situation where I can think of wanting to shift the overall pip configuration around. Or in some cases, you may want to put four pips to eng in case you're pretty far away from a target and you want to close the distance quickly. But it's not generally required because the spire site is comparatively small from an overall space perspective. <clears throat> so for combat, what you want to do is you want to charge your plasma charger shot. As you can see, that pretty much draws your entire web capacitor. And wait until I recharge. At this point, you can hold it and you can fire your side scramblers without actually depleting your weapon capacitor. So you can use your side scramblers to kind of like whittle down a shield together with the beams of our commanders in an instance until the shield falls. And when the shield falls, dang, you release, you charge again quickly, you release, and you charge a third shot, which will partially charge and release, and this is sufficient to kill an Orthless in three quick volleys. Uh, and that's the power of a Cytor Plasma Conda, really, and all there is. Like, if you ever find yourself that you're uh, taking caustic damage because your caustic sinks have filled up, then you kind of switch to the next fire group and you trigger and launch all the caustic sinks and that will clean it, like very quickly clean you of any caustic. And if for whatever reason you need to repair or switch the contamination limpets, again, that's what the third fire group is for. Um, very simple, very easy to use, uh, something that you'll get to the hang of it in absolutely no time. We'll wrap this up with a beautiful showcase on the side of Plasma Conda fighting in the wind during dawn at one of the Spire sites. Hope you enjoy.
And remember, they are coming for you, but we are coming for them. Join the fight. Join the Antixino Initiative. Glory to mankind. Commander Mekin, over and out.